Well, I sent out a survey about five years ago when I was first contemplating this book. I said, I want to know what your biggest challenge is. And hundreds and hundreds of responses came back. And some people responded multiple times with different challenges. It became very clear very quickly that the biggest challenge business owners and entrepreneurs have is knowing what their biggest challenge is. So the biggest challenge is simply knowing what the biggest challenge is. There's a lack of clarity. Everyone was rushing to the apparent. So that became the thesis of the book to resolve that. Michael McCallowitz in the building. How are you doing, man? I'm in the house. I'm doing well, mate. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Nice use of mate as well. I like that. So <laughs> completely anglicized everything, haven't we? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's good. It's good, man. So I, I we're talking about business today. We're talking about how businesses can upgrade and up level themselves. You know, we've got a period of entrepreneurial turmoil at the moment. Oh gosh, yeah. Big challenge. Um, let's forget the current situation that we're in. Why can operating a business be so difficult? Because you've got your product or your service, yeah. and there's customers who need it. So yeah. why why does chaos ensue? Why is it not just plain sailing? Yeah, because there's a million moving pieces. And I don't know if that's the exact number, but there's so many different elements that we need to do. So it's it's a prioritization problem. When, when everything comes at you equally, I, I think many people come to work with a vision or plan for their work, I do, and yet you open email and there's this, incessant, unstoppable chain of questions and direction and demand along with your vendors and clients. So it's it's about being pulled in all these different directions. We don't prioritize. We don't know how to prioritize what we need to do. And uh, and therefore, we try to do everything with equal urgency. So, I, you know, most business owners, it's just this circuitous circle of not making progress. But there's also this relentless need to do something, anything, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Are you... um? You use a term in your book about putting out fires, and that, yeah. it's it's funny that you say that because that's what me and my business partner constantly feel like we're doing. It's just like yeah. what you know that game of whack a mole. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's exactly what this is. You you can never win, right? But but the funny thing is, in whack a mole, you get points every time you hit the mole. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I get it. And so in our business, you know, every time we accomplish something, we give ourselves that conscious or subconscious pat in the back and say, ah. Another thing down, superhero swept in, save the day yet again. Yeah. But then the next mole presents itself and you're whacking it again. So this is actually human biology. We put extraordinary significance in recent emotion and wins. So completing something feels good. But we don't, we're not good at considering the long-term consequence. So we get this little endorphin release, completed a task, got that done. But we're not considering how that task will service in the long term. So it just becomes this perpetual series of just whacking things down. I mean, perfect example of this is people that will be working from home at the moment for the first ever time. I've had a lot of messages from people saying, mate, I have no idea how you do this on a daily basis. They're used to working in an office, perhaps yeah. with more structure, <clears throat> with a boss who's some combination of uh, giving them a direction and breathing down the neck. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, they're, they're struggling. They go to work and everyone that's listening will know this feeling because it doesn't matter. You can even be a, someone with a very prescriptive job, like an engineer and not just a knowledge worker working in the chaotic kind of mental space. Yeah. Um. You, you go to work, you're busy all day, you're adamant that you've done things and then you look back at the end of the day and you say, what did I do today? And you're like, I don't know. I know I was busy and I know yeah. that I did some stuff. Yeah. But upon reflection... I feel like maybe actually I didn't do anything. You know, it's, it's funny. So when, when someone else is giving us direction, they are theoretically doing the thinking for us. So it does become very task oriented and we can at least say at the end of the day, I did what I was told. And that, that feels like accomplishment when, when we're the ones telling us what to do, that's when it becomes the real problem. And so these, these people that are working, uh, a friend of mine is called the, the distributed workforce as opposed to work from home. It's the distributed workforce. There's this autonomy now. You're at home and you're the one who has to tell you what to do. <laughs> and um, therefore, there's this propensity to move to the apparent issues. It's such a trap. There's countless apparent issues. The question, though, is which one's the impactful one? And of all the things presented in front of us, mathematically, only one thing can be the most important at the time. We just need a tool or a way to differentiate that. Otherwise, it becomes this, uh, you know, mouse in the, the spinning wheel. We, we, we keep on moving, but aren't making forward progress. It's, it's very frustrating, but it's human nature. 
that was a, a hammer blow that I needed uh, reapplying to me when I read Fix This Next, your book. Um, and that that point, there can only be one highest priority. There yeah. can only be one most important thing, by definition. Right, by definition. And you, know, these, you, you hear these companies saying, here's our top 10 priorities for this year. It's like, that's bullshit. You can't have 10. What's the number one priority? Well, they're all important. Uh-huh. And, uh, and that, that caused the trap. And if we bring this down to more of a, a micro level um, on a daily basis or by an hourly basis for an individual uh, business owner or employee, um, everything's a priority. Same thing. Like all those little micro tasks are priorities. And uh, that, that's just not mathematically possible. But what it allows us is to escape contemplation. What I believe between every action and reaction, uh, there needs to be contemplation. What, what we default to, though, is in comes that request, action, I'm going to react and you know, take an action around it, delete it or respond to it or, or, or complete the task. But contemplation is where we start prioritizing, the true nature of prioritizing, what's important and needs uh, our attention, what's important and can be deferred, what's unimportant and should be avoided. And, and then we can start you know, differentiating things out. But we don't give ourselves time for that contemplation. That's the problem. I suppose as well, you can have too much time for contemplation, which is where that paradox of choice comes in, right? And you end up yeah. s- just wallowing around in your to-do list with you just sw- drowning in papers and you have no idea what's going on. So uh, let's get into yes. it. W- what is the problem that the fix this next analysis is solving? Yeah. So fix it. the core problem, I call it the survival trap. And how do you can imagine this? is if you take on a piece of paper, you write the letter A on a large piece of paper right in the center and put a circle around it, mm-hmm. that's representative of where we are right now, point A, right? It's it's the either crisis or maybe there's opportunity, but it's whatever we are considering in the moment. And in many businesses, particularly right now, it's it's crisis-oriented. There's, there's demand on us. Well, any action, any direction we go away from point A will give us relief. So say the crisis is we need more sales. Well, if I draw an arrow from point A up saying, and that represents hiring uh, a rainmaker employee, well, I could also draw an arrow to the right that says we're going to cut prices by half. I could draw an arrow to the left saying that we can offer a um, prepay coupon. You know, buy four products today and give us money and you, you'll get it in the future or whatever. You can keep drawing these arrows and any direction you go will get you out of point A, giving you relief. That's, but there's a problem here. If the business needs you going to point B, and you can draw this out on that piece of paper, in the bottom left corner of that paper, draw the letter B and put a circle around it, that's where the business needs you to go. You'll see that many of the decisions we made in this little example, the arrows weren't pointing in that direction. In fact, in some cases, the arrow goes in the polar opposite direction, taking us further away from where the business needs to go. Well, I call this the survival trap, This, this urgent need to get out of crisis, but taking us yet to a new crisis. So what we need is a tool, and this is what I share and fix this next, a specific strategy to know where point B is. It's not about doing uh, the, the right thing. It's doing the right thing at the right time. You know, sometimes we're doing the right thing. We're doing the wrong time. It's like, oh, my business is working. Other times we're doing the wrong thing at the right time, and it doesn't work. It's, it's the combination of two. We need to do the right thing at the right time. So we need clarity on where the hell we need to go in the first place. Yeah. Can you tell us that the biggest problem quote? Can you give us that? Because I absolutely love that. Oh, yeah, right. And this is the thesis of the book. I'll, for, I'll tell you how it came about, the conception. I, I have a, a sizable readership that I'm very blessed to have and, and regular contact. Well, I sent out a survey about five years ago when I was first contemplating this book. And I said, I want to know what your biggest challenge is. And hundreds and hundreds of responses came back. And some people responded multiple times with different challenges. It became very clear very quickly that the biggest challenge business owners and entrepreneurs have is knowing what their biggest challenge is. So the biggest challenge is simply knowing what the biggest challenge is. There's a lack of clarity. Everyone was rushing to the apparent. So that became the thesis of the book to resolve that. I love it, man. If you can teach me and my business partner to work out what our biggest problem is, I will be, you, you will have done more than we've done in 13, 13 years of business because you're right. Okay. Well, that's that, my goal then. We'll do it in the next Let's see if we can do it minutes. today. We've got 40 minutes to go. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the business hierarchy of needs. I recently had um, uh, Scott Barry Kaufman on, the guy that hosts the psychology podcast, big time lover of Abraham Maslow. So we've yes. recently, recently gone through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Perfect. Uh, but today we're talking business 
hierarchy of needs. What are they? Yeah, and and they're they're very similar with one extraordinarily important and significant differentiation. So back to Maslow's, then you're very familiar with the basis physiological all the way up to self actualization. What Maslow was arguing, and what's important as it translates over to the business hierarchy of needs, is that if a base level need is not being satisfied, that becomes a primary need. The example I use is the base level is physiological, breathing air, drinking water. The next level above that safety needs like seeking shelter from the elements or clothing or protection from harm. Well, if, if I'm outside, I, I live outside New York City, and some of these winters we get here are, you know, sub-zero, I'm talking Fahrenheit, so sub-30, minus 30 Celsius, you know, freezing temperatures. If I'm outside in a T-shirt and these temperatures are coming in, I will biologically respond by seeking shelter and clothing immediately because otherwise I will die from hypothermia. Conversely, um, if while I'm out there, all of a sudden someone puts a plastic bag over my head and wraps duct tape around my neck, I'm now suffocating. My primary need has shifted to even a more base level need, physiological. I need air. I will tear at that bag to rip it open because I'm dying for air. The, the freezing doesn't matter until I get that bag open. Then I'm running for shelter. So Maslow says if a base level needs not being satisfied, we revert to it. Well, our business has a similar structure, but there's one significant difference, and I'll explain the structure for business. The significant difference is this. We are not biologically wired into our business. You know, we are biologically wired into ourselves. Therefore, if you're walking down a dark alley in Newcastle and you all of a sudden get the creeps that someone's going to attack you, all the you time. should turn, you know, turn around and walk away. And, and the reason is, is your, your senses, sight, smell, hearing, are triggering that emotion. In our business, we're not neurologically wired. Yet, business owners consistently say, Chris, oh, I trust my gut. I need more sales. I can feel it. I need it. No, you can't feel it. It's impossible <laughs> to feel it be because you're not neurologically wired in. It's a, maybe a beacon, a call to action. Maybe there's an instinct that's triggering, but we actually need the empirical data. Here's, here's the business hierarchy of needs, and, and you and your partner can start using this in your business right now. The base level needs for all organizations are sales. That is the creation of oxygen for a business. We need inbound cash flow. But immediately above that is profit. Profit is the creation of stability for an organization. Now, these two are already interrelated, and all the levels are. The foundation must be strong enough to support the level above it. But it just needs to be adequate. For example, I need sales, and I ask myself in my business, am I creating sales, any sales? And if the answer is yes, I then ask simply the next question. Am I creating enough sales to support a degree of profitability? Are my sales adequate? And this is where businesses already get messed up. Many businesses owners don't consider the stability of the organization. They simply say, sales cures everything. <laughs> we need to sell our way out of it, which is the biggest bunch of, of lies ever. Sales do not cure everything. Sales actually translates to organizational stress. Stress. The more sales I have, the more responsibility placed on my organization. And if I'm a small company and I, and I run the business, that's more stress on me. So sales is important to the degree that it supports profitability. Mm. Profitability is stability. And um, sadly, right now with this crisis going on with COVID and stuff, I see business after business here in where I live uh, outside New York City collapsing because all they cared about was sales. They don't have any runway of cash, no protection, no stability. And within weeks, some of them in days of the crisis are out of business for life. Well, I mean, that, I think that reflects um, business owners and generally people's personal um, proclivities with the way that they set their own finances up, right? There's that, statistic, right. Oh, yeah. that statistic that <clears throat> I think 80% of Americans don't have more than one month of uh, a cash set aside, you know, like that sure. month, that month's gone. That month's been it's true. gone. And that month's gone and we're done. It's abysmal. It's, it's absolutely abysmal. When you then, People are folk you ratchet that up to the business level yeah. and you're like, that's, we had five working days of capital. Yep. That's how much liquidity we were playing with. Yeah. It's, so, so what happens is desperation kicks in. Now we start doing desperate moves to save the business, big sales, big discounts, anything to save the business which if it stabs the immediate moment, if it saves you, you're simply at point A and you drew an arrow out, the crisis will be worse because now how are you gonna recover from this? You're making less, less make, you're making less profit. You've even, even undermined the company more. So people focus on how much they make, not how much they take. And those are radically different. Level two in the business hierarchy of needs, how much is your business taking? That is the stability of the organization. 
But once we achieve that, we simply ask ourselves, do we have a degree of stability? Do we have enough stability to support the next level in the business hierarchy of needs, which is order? Order is the creation of efficiency. Efficiency gives the business strength because organizational efficiency reduces the dependency on any individual. That if the business owner gets sick, and that used to be an analogy, now it's very real, you can get sick, and are taken out of the business for weeks or months, can the business continue to deliver on its values and promises to its clients? And this isn't true just for the boss, it's true for anyone in the organization. Um, can, can the, and, and the business, and there's other opportunities in efficiency that as a business delivers on efficiency, it can bring more value and more margin to a business benefiting profit. So these all work interrelated. The, the remaining two levels in the business hierarchy of needs are impact. Impact is the creation of transformation. This is where your, your business is beyond the transaction of the service or products it provides. It's about transforming the lives of pe the people it touches. And then the highest level of business is called legacy, which is the creation of permanence. This is when, you, when a business achieves permanence, what I found is that's when the business owner realizes they were never business owners. They were stewards of this organization. It's its own entity, and it's meant to live on without them, beyond them. So these are the five levels. And the, the final thought I want to share about the business hierarchy of needs is this is not a ladder. It's not about climbing to the top and waving to your friends from the top. What it is, is a, is a pattern of needs that need to be addressed. And we simply ask our questions, is the base adequate to support the level above it? Is that level adequate to support the level above that? And if not, we have to revert to the base. Like, like building a building, a structure of five stories, you don't start on the fourth story and say, let's just put a building up here and it falls into thin air and collapses. And at the same time, you don't build this massive basement foundation and put a little tool shed on top of it <laughs> because it would fall in it. They have to work relationally. What are some of the common mistakes that you see business owners making which go against the fix this next analysis or, or the, the business hierarchy of needs? How do people get this as wrong as they can get? Yeah, the, well, I'll give you the two most common because they come right to mind. The first most common, particularly in startup businesses, is they focus at the impact or legacy level. They, they go into business saying, we want to change the world. I will do everything to be the, you know, the business that just changes everything. And then they don't think or consider the foundation of sales. They don't master profit or efficiency. They just go, we're changing the world. And very quickly, the business has no structural uh, rigidity below it, and the business collapses on itself. There's these great ideas and concepts that just deflate upon themselves. So that's the most common problem. The second one is sales cures all. It is a horrible belief. They just build this foundation and foundation of sales. True story, I have a friend who, uh, a dear friend, who had a company that did $250 million US in annual revenue. Wow. And yeah, exactly. And that's what people say, whoa, that's a big business. Um, and sadly it collapsed within two weeks not of the COVID virus, of a bad strategic decision they made six months ago, and the entire business collapsed like that wow. because they made a bad strategic decision. They didn't consider the next level of profit. They didn't bring stabil financial stability to the organization. So it's a shame, but most, many business owners think that sales cures all and our ego is tied to it. That's the kind of a third component. It's like it's all about the entrepreneur Joneses, you know, I got to keep up with you. You're doing a million. I got to do two million. You're doing two. I got to do five. It's this constant back and forth of the vanity metric of sales and revenue without the consideration of sanity of cash profits. Man, top line is bullshit. Top line is, has, been, bullshit. has been bullshit for as long as I've done business. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. I, I run nightclubs. That's been yeah. my job. I'm a club promoter in the UK. We're fortunate we've got a lot of cities, Newcastle, Manchester, Leeds, some big party cities. People like to go out and they like to have good events to head to and thankfully we can service that need. Um, but in our industry, it's very easy. It's like um, it's kind of like a, f a football match or like a sports game yeah. every week and you've got your match and your competitors, your rival teams have all got their matches and they say, we did, we did 2,000 people tonight well we did three thousand people yeah, yeah, tonight yeah, yeah, right, right, and you're right. like well i know for a fact that your venue capacity is only 1800 like where did yeah. you fit the extra 1200 people um but there's so i see this right i see this manifest and everybody that's that's listening will know the friend that talks about maybe they don't give out the pure figures of 
how much money they took, but it's, it was this busy. Or we did a restaurant owner that always talks about how many covers they did last night. It's like, you're not telling me about how your business rates right. on that in ridiculous location that you've got are completely pulling your ass out. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and you're having to pay yourself dividends out of the company in a desperate attempt because your director's wage isn't covering the car payments that you've got to do or your mortgage or whatever it might be. Um, and again, as a final yeah. example that kind of comes from my own experience with regards to this sales versus profit uh, relationship, typically I- price elasticity of demand would suggest that when you put the price up, your level of demand goes down. So me and my business partner, you can imagine we have these club nights. Some of them are really cheap entry, you know, a, a one pound for a very early on entry. And then it maybe yeah. goes up to five and six pounds later on. And um, we were looking at, we were like, I just can't get this night to to become as profitable as we want it to. We know it's popular. We know that it's good. Um, how can, And we're looking at stripping back costs and doing this, that and the other. But you're always concerned about putting your price up because you know there's so many competitors that can come in. They can always jump in and go and get it. And I, it's usually my business partner that's the, uh, the guy that's kind of on the, the grind for the finances stuff. But for once, I was like, look, man, let's just, let's see what happens if we put the entry price up across the board by a pound. We did it. Mm. The numbers didn't move. And you add, because of the way that there's Double no, it. there's no variable costs. There's zero variable yeah. cost. If you walk past the front door or if you go in, it's the same. Right. Um, I don't have to make you the food. I don't have to sell you the drink. I literally take the money from the door. And yeah. it was like, that's eight hundred pounds a week on your bottom line, bottom line and top line for nothing. Yeah. So to to loop back around, top lines bullshit, bottom lines everything. I agree. Yeah, and, and people use I call it entrepreneurial rounding, right? So it's like, oh, you know, you know, ten people show, but it felt like fifty. So I'll say fifty. <laughs> and and people say this with the revenue too. You know, I can't tell you how many companies say they do a million dollars in revenue, and I'll be shocked if they're doing five hundred thousand or you know. It's rounded. Round. Is it rounded to the nearest million? <laughs> yeah, you round to the nearest million. Yeah, and it's funny, but we put such significance in it. I'm trying to change the question here, and when people say how big's your business, and and people may not be so bold to ask you your revenue, but they'll say how many employees do you have? They'll try to guess it. I say, hey, before we have this conversation, let's talk about how healthy our business is. And that's when people like our deer in headlights and, well, uh, what do you mean how healthy? Well, let's just talk about the only number that matters. Let's talk about profit. And it becomes a uncomfortable conversation for Very people. Very uncomfortable. But, but that's that's all that really matters. I don't believe a big business is better. I believe the right size business that's very profitable is better. Well, both myself and you will know some business owners who have a couple of employees and turnover, the, the top line is okay, yeah. But their their bottom line is the sort of figure that huge hundred person medium sized enterprises yes. would kill for. Yeah, I, I salivate when I yeah. There's people that do that, and I aspire to be. I was the other guy. I was the guy who was bragging. Hey, did seven mil this year, and I had I had lawn furniture in my house because I couldn't afford furniture. <laughs> I I want to be, and I'm behaving consistently with it for quite a period of time now. Is I, I actually am very proud of our small business. We have 12 employees, and and most of our employees are part-time employees, and I am proud of that. And we are achieving profit margins that are very comfortable and, and, and give us a lot of protection. And that's what I want to grow. And I know people that have achieved that 10 times even healthier than I have, and that, that's the aspiration for a good business. I really believe that. Well, man, look at this, this age of um, what we're doing right now. You know, you're writing and podcasting. Yeah. Yeah. You've got some podcasters, even medium sized guys in the US, less so in the UK, some medium sized guys in the US that I know that are turning over a hundred grand a year as a as a side hustle for doing their podcast. Yeah. Just for selling ads. And, and they're uh, of that hundred grand turnover, they're probably keeping like ninety grand in their pocket. <laughs> what, are the, what are their costs? Oh well, my my camera lens broke because I sat on it, and oh, <laughs> I need to pay for my I need to pay for my podcast hosting, and uh, yeah. maybe maybe get a new microphone or whatever. You're totally right. You can run these hyper lean businesses. So yeah, definitely. If there's any entrepreneurs that that are listening and are thinking, yeah, I, I, I've kind of been a bit focused on on sales, and now. Uh, I'm being told by Michael that I need to perhaps flip that, look at yeah. look at my profit a little bit more. But how how do we move from sales to profit? I mean, there's only really two figures, right? There's how much are you taking and how much are you spending? Exactly, exactly. So profit is um, is is driven by exactly that thing: cost, control, margin. 
Uh, margin is the spread between what you sell something for and what you collect for, right? So we can always increase or we should seek ways to increase margin and reduce cost. The interesting thing is cost can only be reduced by so much. There's a certain point you can't cut costs anymore because either you're cutting the muscle of your company, meaning you can't produce or you've hit zero and you can't go below zero. Margin can always increase. So what I do with a lot of businesses is if they have some degree of sales, they have the, the base business hierarchy achieved, we then say, well, what are the necessary costs for that sales? And we can cut in many businesses 10, even 15 or 20 percent like like that unnecessary subscriptions and so forth. You can cut a certain amount of fat out of the business, but at certain points are cutting muscle and you got to stop there. Then we look at the margin and that's where the big opportunity is. And, and your your example at the door, one pound versus two pounds, like that's you doubled your margin. <laughs> that is it's a hundred percent growth. That's unbelievable. And no one flinched. Yeah. That's the big opportunity. And and what as I went through the business hierarchy of needs and fix this next, I and as interviewing companies, I found that the biggest resistance about increasing margin is actually not from the clients themselves. It's from the business owner thinking that they can't do it in the first place. Oh man, you are you are striking at the heart of entrepreneurs across the world at the moment. Like, especially if you're a, a small business owner, you feel the fear that you have, the level of anxiety that you have when you think <laughs> about putting the price up, is. It, 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 unbelievable. I remember the, yeah, unbelievable. The, the first time that we started, this was a long time ago now, first time that we were going to raise the price on the door. And I was adamant. I was like, right, no one's going to come. No one's going to come. It's gone yeah, from £2.50 yeah. to £3.50 before 11 o'clock. And I'm like, it's a Saturday. Looking back now, I'm like, it should have been £6. It should have, yeah, been, yeah, yeah. It should have been two times. It should have been three times that. But at the time, you're just terrified. Completely, completely terrified. No one's going to come. Everyone's going to think it's shit. It's never worth anything. You know, and the, the funny thing is that, that is the exact feeling. We go through all of the worst case scenarios. We're going to lose clients and so forth. Here's the truth. If those people didn't come and when you're charging three pounds 50, when, when you're charging that and clients don't come, that means they don't value that venue as much as you, th you want them to. If, if, if you're going to say, you know what, an extra pound, no way, this is not for me. Those are cheap clients. Do you really want those clients in the first place? And that's what we got to consider. If, if people are not going to buy something at a higher price point, do they really value what we're offering? Uh, and that also means that then the onus is on us to share the value, to show the benefits of paying the additional money. And that's the the challenge that many businesses have is actually just enunciating what value they deliver. Often they just increase price uh, and they're, they're afraid of increasing price because people will leave, but they don't even consider if I do increase price, I need to tell them the value that they're really getting. That's inherently there in many cases. They just need to make it public. And, uh, and then... You know, when you do it, you're often surprised. Like, oh my gosh, no one, no one blinked an eye. I should have done this years ago. I'm a fool. Well, in other businesses that aren't as um, easy to acquire customers, like I say, it's the same cost. There's no variable cost. There's essentially no extra work for us to do. A thousand people versus five hundred yeah. people. DJ's got to be there. Door staff and us and blah blah blah. It's the same. It's essentially the same event. But a yeah. lot of other businesses aren't. And yeah. The interesting relationship, I think you touched on it at the very beginning where you said that um, increasing sales actually increases headaches yes. a lot of the time. And if you had the choice to make the same profit at half the sales that you're doing at the moment. Oh, God's heaven. You know, like there's a stage where you get to where you're like, well, I essentially could have the entire business running off the back of one client, which is why you're yep. now no longer hedged against risk if that one client decides to go away. That's right. But everybody knows where that, or you should know where that kind of middle ground lies. And it's like, yeah, if you can continue to use price as an indicator of quality, continue to move your way up to higher and higher quality clients who need, who mean business more and more, especially if you're looking at B2B, I'm going to guess, you know, if you're, if you're in that sort of a business and you keep moving up that better, better client range, another perfect example, one of the co-hosts of the show, Johnny and Yusuf, they used to do online coaching, PTs doing mm -hmm. diet plans, this, that, and the other 50 pounds, hundred pounds for a, a eight week um, beach body ready type thing. Yeah, um, yeah. They realized that the low cart value stuff, although that was what they understood, it wasn't what was getting them fired up. They switched and they started coaching coaches. So their cart value is now from 80 pounds to a thousand pounds. Yeah. And they'll do the same number of sales calls. Yeah. But they're now, <laughs> and their conversion will be lower. They're not going to sell as many at a thousand as they were at 80, but the people yeah. that they work with, they love, they're serious. You don't have yeah. someone who just happens to spend a thousand pounds on a course. It's like, I, I'm put enough money in for this to be serious. So there's two examples from people that the 
um, audience will know personally from listening to this show who have had this very situation that you're talking about right now happen in their businesses? It, it reminds me of a story um, of uh, the University of Mississippi and the, the power of this business hierarchy of needs and how making shifts like you're saying and just changing the perspective that you can generate the same amount of income with a lot less effort. Th- this story just, just shocked me. So University of Mississippi is in what we call the Southeast Conference. This is a conference of universities. And there's, I think, 15 universities in there. Uh, University of Mississippi, also called Ole Miss, uh, Ole Miss uh, had the lowest uh, applicant rate of all the SEC schools back about 15 years ago. So people were applying everywhere but Ole Miss. And they realized this is a sales problem, right? We're not getting enough applications, not enough prospects. Well, they do in a study and they realize that students pick a university within typically five minutes of visiting that campus based upon how the campus looks. It's a very instinctual, I like this place looks beautiful, I'm in, or this place looks like shit, I'm out. Well, Ole Miss unfortunately had the reputation of looking like shit. So that was a sales problem. They weren't attracting enough prospects. Sometimes in this business hierarchy, you can get two birds with one stone. Well, they realize they need to beautify the campus. They talked to, there's a guy named Jeff McManus there. He was the uh, oversaw the landscaping at Ole Miss and found that the uh, landscaping team couldn't maintain this 1,000 acre property uh, adequately. They could just keep up with the mowing and that was it. They couldn't do the beautification projects, installing plants and flowers. Well, Jeff uh, talks with his team and says, why, why are we struggling to beautify the campus? And they said, because we're so inefficient. So the, the team talked about a challenge at the order or efficiency level. He said, well, what's the problem? These guys said, we have these sit on mowers that we go running down on the campus mowing the lawns, but the tree limbs are so low that we have to jiggle back and forth around the tree limbs to mow. When we get to a mulch patch where we have all the mulch, they're square patterns and we have to do these angular cuts and it slows us down. So they made some suggestions. They said, let's just cut the tree limbs up about two or three meters so that we can go right under the the tree limbs in a straight line. Let's make the mulch patterns oval shaped so we can do sweeping motions and keep going on. They, They made other changes too, but it was all about the efficiency of these mowers. They were able to mow the entire 1,000 acre property now in half the time, which meant the other half their time they had available to do beautification projects. Within a year of these changes, the efficiency of Ole Miss had improved so much, the beautification projects were, were implemented. Application rates started to skyrocket back in early 2000 because now students were coming to campus and saying, this is beautiful. Ole Miss today um, holds the prestigious title of having one of the most beautiful campuses in all of the United States. Because they identified the hierarchical needs. They said, we have a sales issue. The sales issue was triggered by another opportunity in efficiency. They combined the two, killed two birds with one stone, and Ole Miss you know, benefited in a significant way. I love that. So let's move, let's move from profit to order. Yeah. How, we, how, yeah. we, how are we moving from profit to order? Yeah, so the, the question is, do we have enough stability in the organization to bring about organizational efficiency? Some businesses try to get more and more efficient. How do we get more done with less effort? without considering the demand it puts on resources to do that. As you bring more efficiency to a business, it takes more effort to achieve it. Uh, One one example, too, is in scalability. The the bigger you get, efficiency works to your advantage. There was a manufacturer I interviewed in Pennsylvania. They make playsets. They were the, at the time before they sold their company, they were the biggest playset manufacturer. They're now a part of a conglomerate. And they had this massive, massive machine. And uh, this machine would paint the play sets. Well, what was interesting was the setup for a machine to get it ready to start running a run could take about three to four hours of effort, maybe even more time. So when when you spend three or four hours doing it, if one play set goes through and it gets painted in five seconds, it didn't get painted in five seconds. It got painted in four hours and five seconds. Well, when the second one went through, it didn't get painted in five seconds. It got painted in two hours and five seconds, right? Because that setup time has been split in half. As more would go through it, the setup time became less and less important. So once you really get the steam rolling and they were sending thousands of set of uh, places through, they are making money big time. Well, that's why efficiency is so important at this level. We first need to have some kind of sales, consistent sales in there, profitability, sustainability, and that must be at a level of significant enough that we start focusing on efficiencies because it brings value back to the organization. That's how it works. And as you get more efficient, it may trigger you to say, now we can support more sales. 
let's go back to the sales level. So instead of climbing a ladder here, we start cycling back down. We build the base of sales stronger, allows more profitability, allows more efficiency. And we cycle back down and we'll start ping ponging around uh, as the business grows. Kind of like a, like a volcano. Uh, a mountain is formed by a volcano flowing down more lava and then yet again and again and the mountain gets bigger. Yeah, I get it. The So order your middle section of yes. the of the pyramid. I think this is where me and my business partners spend a lot of our time. We're very yeah. um, process oriented. We like to have, there's a document written for everything. Anything that's ever happened that we think might happen again, there's a process written for it. And I think you touched on that about the um, the owner or the CEO or the MD or the partner or whatever being ill or being unavailable yes. for a period of time and the business being able to continue without them. Yeah, I, I call it the four-week vacation, and uh, sometimes four-week vacations are not planned. We're all on one at the moment. Yeah. We're all on are one you? at the moment. Yeah. Well, 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 I mean, it's a corona vacation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, yeah. Touche. We're all on that. But it was funny. I, you know, I speak a lot in the U.S., occasionally in Europe, and uh, in the U.S., no one takes vacation. You know, you're, you're actually uh, considered weak if you don't work through vacations that you do take, and it's a horrible mentality because the problem is a business becomes – uh, is being carried on the back by the business owner. And if they are taking, have a coronavirus or something, the entire business stops because the business owner has failed and it can go under. So the four vacation, the idea is if someone can leave a business for four consecutive weeks and the business continues to flourish with them fully disconnected physically and digitally, there's a business that's no longer dependent on the owner. It can grow on its own. Well, when I, I toured through Europe, I was in Germany recently. I'm like, you got to take this four vacation. You know, people laughed at me. They said, welcome to August. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, Europe man. shuts down yeah. and it's like, oh my God, this is predominantly an American phenomenon, but sadly it's, it's seeking, it's kind of seeping out all over the world that we need to be workaholics and that's wrong. We, we actually need to prove that we can remove ourselves from the business because it will happen. Maybe it's not a vacation, maybe it's an illness or you get hurt, but it will happen and we need to remove that dependency of, of being on an owner. Anyone that's listening who runs a business or even is just in a business where you get to know who the CEO is, just take a second and think what would happen if the boss left for four weeks now? And especially if you're a business owner, that visceral, that fear that you're, you've got that's rising in your chest that makes you want to throw up onto your AirPods, um, that's, that is, that's how I, we felt for a very, very long time. And, especially in this world now where increasingly you've got lots of small businesses. You know, I wouldn't like to guess what the average number of employees is in a business in the UK, but I'd guess maybe something like 20, probably, you know, like or 20 or 50, something like that, like a typical, typical sort of size company. Mm -hmm. And that means that the owners moved up through the ranks. They know the office, they, they, the landlord that owns the thingy, they go out for beers with the guy that owns the office block, that, you know, everything, every little bit. And you've got your claws into all of these different sections yeah. of it. And every one of those claws needs unpicking one by one, <laughs> yeah, by yeah. one all the way along to allow you to relinquish that control. It's very emotionally for something that's supposed to be sales, profit, order, efficiency. Yeah. It's actually, you get into the point now where you're like, it's an emotional interaction yes. you need to let go of and i loved your example because it is talons in a business and the removal is not like you just release it sadly actually though that is the perception of many business owners that one day there'll be a switch flipped somehow magically that all of a sudden the business runs itself you're like i'm retiring i'm selling this and i'm gonna make tons of money but the reality is this is a throttle we have to slowly and specifically and deliberately extract those claws one step at a time from the business and um, it can take sometimes months, in many businesses, years to extract the owner fully. I've implemented it in my own business, and I've now reinserted myself. And what I mean by this is I was running the operations. I was involved in every little task. Well, I started to remove myself. I've now brought on a president that runs the company. Her name's Kelsey. She runs the organization. And now that the business can run on the day-to-day -day completely without me, it's freed me up to do what gives me the most passion, which is be the spokesperson. I love talk and shop, like what we're doing now, Chris. I love this, and I love writing books. So now I can do the things I'm passionate about, but if I get sick or I leave the business, yes, the spokesperson role's not filled, but the core essence of the business will continue on. Here's a perfect way for people to frame this as well. If you're a business owner that's listening and 
you've never relinquished that control. But as you've just explained there, Michael, you, you were able to bring someone on who was able to do the things that you were capable of doing. Think about that as a business owner. If you were able to bring someone on and write them a document that was how to be Michael dot doc X, like, <laughs> yeah. and just write them a big thing. This is what, this is how you do me. It's like, if, yeah. you, if someone can do the job that you are doing now off the back of a document that explains how to do it, where is your unique talent being placed within this business? You're just a, you're just a guy. You're just a, a yeah. bleep, 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 input, output. Like yeah. that's it. That's it. There's no longer your um, unique creative vision that's being deployed to the business. You're just computer program. That's right. Yeah, we're avoiding playing into our strengths. And uh, the funny thing is Kelsey doesn't replace me. Kelsey's like 10 times better than me. She understands uh, you know, her super strength is in human connection. She, my colleagues here have an adoration for her that supersedes the adoration or <laughs> that they had for me. And it's, it's almost painful to say that, but it's realistic. And I love, I love my colleagues. I will do anything for them. And I feel they, the same way about me, but Kelsey, Kelsey has that something special. They will take a bullet for her. They will protect and defend her because she protects and defends them. So not only does she replace me, she's amplified the strength of our organization it's funny as I was writing fix this next, I was looking at organizational charts and most org charts are pyramid structures up top. It says, it doesn't even say president. It says the word me, and there's a long, long arrow, <laughs> yeah. you know, a long, long line going down to the minions down below. That's the vice president of sales and all these different things. Well, those structures are, are a, a structure that plays into titles, not into strengths. A better organizational structure is, is, is matching someone's tasks, or talents to the task they have at hand, a web-like structure. We, we actually don't have, to, no one has titles here. I, I, I act as a spokesperson. I, I write books, but I don't have a title. Kelsey actually is the only one with the title. She's the president um, because we need that for certain discussions and stuff. And, and everyone needs to know that, you know, if you have a small, or small business, but no one else has a title. They just serve roles. And what that's allowed is us to be very dynamic in our capacity when, when we have a massive order for, say, books that we're shipping, usually our distributor does it, but if we have to do it, we have three people that can shift over to that, no problem. If we have a large amount of customer service calls, we have one person that caters to that, but we have th two other people cross-trained in that, we can shift resources there. So by doing role specialization and matching to people's talents and removing titles, it allows this almost organic shifting of the business, and, and people don't feel compelled to stick within their role of a title. Yeah, I love it. So we've got two left, impact and legacy. Let's talk briefly about impact. Yeah, so what, there's a fascinating transition that happens at this level. The first three levels we talked about is about getting. We need to get sales, get profit, get efficiency in our organization. Impact, we flip the mile. It's about contribution now of giving. Impact is where we are serving our client beyond the transaction. It's life-changing for them. And when I say life-changing, I don't mean like you've saved someone's life, but there's a shift in their life. There's some kind of meaning beyond the commodity, and they put significance in you. The, the example I like to use is Harley-Davidson. Anyone can sell a motorcycle. You buy a Harley-Davidson, you now belong to the Harley-Davidson community. You're a weekend warrior, you're a tough guy, or whatever the title is, but you belong to a family. Now, you don't have to transform people by making them belong to a community. There's countless ways to do it. But we want our clients saying, wow, this is something greater in my life than I ever expected. And they see that value. That's transformation. And I will tell you this, you don't have to do it. I don't think Walmart transforms people's lives, um, at least not here in the U.S. They actually probably deplete people's lives, quite frankly. But but they do deliver on the three levels very well. They're, they're, they offer sales. They offer a value of cheapness. Uh, they, they, they're profitable and they're, they're efficient. But I don't know if they're transforming lives. Some businesses can make this election. And this is when you start realizing – to the degree you are a steward of something good here. You you have a platform now of service, um, but it's a choice to be there. And I don't think it's better or worse. It's just a choice. The highest level is impact. Impact is the creation of permanence. And this is where you legacy. set your, what was that? Legacy, not impact. Legacy. Um, I'm sorry. Legacy. Yep. Legacy is the creation of permanence. And legacy is where you set your business to live into perpetuity. It's where you re realize even you, the founder aren't important in this. I mean, you are significant, you served a role, but it's the business that's important and that it can continue to have its impact as a legacy into perpetuity. This is a question you've already touched on it there. I asked, should every business aim toward 
impact and or legacy. You know, it's right. going to be it's going to be challenging for me as someone who gets 18 to 21 year olds drunk for a couple of years <laughs> while right. they're at university to have right. a legacy. You know, and right. I, I I appreciate that. I understand what it is. So how how do I know how do I know whether I should let go? And also, you've said as well, some people kind of set the sights on the peak of the mountain and everything else falls. Yeah, away. yeah. So the answer is no. Not everyone should do it. We should speak to what our heart calls out to do. I have a friend who's got a business that does 15 million US. It is efficient. It doesn't need him. He's making money. And he's like, I'm off to the golf courses. He's like, I'm going to go golfing every day of my I love life it. now. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm like, that is good. And I actually would argue it's more than good. It's noble because the company is providing for employees. It is giving uh, great services. It's, it's supporting the economy. But I also feel one day he'll wake up and say, is this all there is? And I think that's the calling. When there's that sensation, is this all there is? We realize that our business or a new business can be a platform for expression. I've had, for me, that transition. I had businesses that made money and I became a millionaire and uh, I thought it was all about the cars and the big house and the vacation house in Hawaii. I thought that's what it was. And then I had the awakening. For me, I said, no, no, there, there's something else going on. And uh, that's when I decided to devote myself to having uh, impact and legacy. Additionally, I'm absolutely responsible to master sales, profit, and order. You can't skip levels here. You can't just go out and say, I'm going to change the world. That's a business that will collapse on itself. So I am very regimented in driving sales that are adequate to support profit, profit that can bring about efficiency in order for me to have impact and legacy. Man, I love it. Before we go, I know that we're tight on time. I got one final thing. Upon you speaking about the fact that you um, manifested some of this material wealth, then got red pilled either by a combination of yourself and the way that you place that you were in your life, and then yeah. realized that wasn't it. Um, <clears throat> I was listening to Naval Ravikant on uh, Tim Ferriss, and he gave this quote, and man, it, it just hit me straight between the eyes. And it said, it is far easier to fulfill your material desires than it is to renounce them. <laughs> oh, touche. <laughs> Very I, true. I wonder whether or not part of your transcendence, this uh, fulfilling of potential uh, and the, the change of dynamic has been serviced by the fact that that box has been ticked that Michael no longer has anything to prove on the, yeah, I've had the home in Hawaii. I've had the this. Yeah. I think I think a lot of people might need to go through that fire and actually tick those boxes. Does that make sense? It, it, it totally makes sense. Like, it's funny. So we all know or heard that it's not about the money. It's not about the acquisition of stuff. Um, but I also agree that the only way – for most of us to discover that is to go through the experience. It's all well and good. Someone telling us that, but look at the people who say it. I know. As they fly in their private jet over fuck, you and say, yeah. fuck you, Warren Buffett. Like, stop telling me about how Zen you can be and how easy and simple yeah. life is because you no longer have to play that game. You exactly. have already done it. So man, I, I've absolutely loved today. Fix this next. Your book will be linked in the show notes below. Thanks, if people want to hassle you online, where should they go? Go to MikeMotorbike.com. It's actually Mike Michalowicz, but no one can spell Michalowicz. Mike Motorbike, as in the motorcycle, is my <laughs> nickname from high school. Yeah. So that'll forward to my site. My books are there, free chapters. I use to write for the Wall Street Journal. You can get that. And I have my own podcast uh, there too. What's the podcast called? Uh, it's called Entrepreneurship Elevated. I love it. That'll be linked as well. You know what to do if you've enjoyed this episode. Like, share, and subscribe. All of the stuff that we've gone through today will be linked below. Man, I think... I really love the framework. I think it's it's great. Um, and it's nice to read a book. I did five years at Newcastle Uni Business School. And um, nice. I constantly read things which didn't reflect my experience in as a young business owner. And this is the precise opposite. I'm coming up with stories that tell you the concepts from your book because I'm seeing what happened. So, man, uh, awesome. It. Thank you so much for your time, Mike. Brother, thank you. <laughs>